This is part two of fixing my homemade helicopter after the drive shaft failed. I'm going to talk you through a design decision in order to fix my helicopter and this will hopefully demonstrate what's involved with making just one decision with such a project. The decision I need to make is, should I go from a belt drive to a chain drive? The belt worked, but there are some concerns I have with it. In the beginning, I used Gates Drive design software to determine the belt type and pulley diameters with a reduction of 5.6 to 1. I had 140 teeth on the big pulleys and 25 teeth on the small one. The software told me the minimum pulley diameter stroke number of teeth on the driving sprocket is 22. The 5.6 to 1 ratio I went for was wrong and the blades were spinning too fast. I actually tested the rotor up to 1000 RPM with this ratio. Nice to know it handled that okay. I then changed the ratio to 7 to 1 by making a new 20 tooth drive pulley. I knew this was below the recommended 22 tooth minimum. I thought at the time that it's probably to do with the number of teeth in engagement with the pulley. I knew the belts could handle 48 horsepower each so decided as I'm only running 30 horsepower on each belt that would be okay. But I forgot about the reduced radius of the pulley potentially reducing the life of the belt because of the increased bending. This has been bothering me plus the belts might have been stressed in the unscheduled rapid disassembly video. Some comments in the last video said that the pulley teeth I described as bent could have just been worn to give the illusion of bent teeth. I'll investigate this later in the video. The belts are very expensive to replace and chains could be a good alternative. If chains would allow me to increase the reduction further, say to 7.5 to 1, then a lot more lift could be achieved. More lift equals more weight that can be added to cool the engine, more flight duration and more power to get out of ground effect. You might be wondering then why I didn't choose chains in the first place. This was to do with chain speed. Reading data online said I had to run the chains in an oil bath because the chain speed was too high otherwise. This data I now believe to be misleading. Let's have a look at a motorbike chain. This is a Kawasaki Ninja 250R. It has the same horsepower as I'm using per rotor and could be using a chain that is suitable for me. The 250R uses a 520 size chain. The 5 is the pitch of the chain in 1 8 of an inch. So 5 8 of an inch is the pitch or 15.875 millimeters. The pitch is the distance from one link pin to the next link pin. The 2 is the roller width, also in 1 8 of an inch. So 2 8 roller width for 520 chain. Same as quarter inch or 6.35 millimeters. That is the roller width. Now I need to know what the chain speed is at the bike's top speed. Chain speed is measured in meters per second. Let's find out what that is. This is the calculation using the bike's engine RPM and gearbox ratios to give a chain speed of 14.9 meters per second. The chain speed on the helicopter with a 7.5 to 1 reduction ratio would be 12.7 meters per second. It looks as though then that the chain speed would be okay without having to run in an oil bath. Now I need to know about chain strength. Will a 520 chain be strong enough? And what is the approximate load per tooth on the drive sprocket with the Kawasaki Ninja? I've worked out that with the Kawasaki Ninja, each tooth is loaded with approximately 158 pounds of force. With a new gear ratio of 7.5 to 1 on the helicopter, the approximate tooth loading will be 202 pounds. This means I cannot use the 520 chain with an 8 tooth drive sprocket. I need an 8 tooth drive sprocket in order to keep the driven sprockets small enough to fit within the drive framework. The next size chain is 530 and if we take the example of the Honda Blackbird it uses a 530 size chain. Maximum chain speed with this bike is 25.7 meters per second which is great and the sprocket tooth loading is 320 pounds. This chain far exceeds the speed and tooth loading required and is going to be my choice. Sprockets are available to purchase online, as is the chain. The last question to answer is, what is the weight difference between my belt drive and the proposed chain drive? Sprockets and chain weight are available online and it's looking like the weight is going to be about the same. As mentioned, with the modified ratio providing increased lift, this all sounds a very good choice. I was actually asked in a YouTube comment three years ago by LeanNav why I didn't go for chains. A question that I have not forgotten. Well done, Neem Nav. 
On the pulley teeth that I said were bent, a few comments said it was wear from the belts giving the illusion of bent teeth, and I think this makes more sense. Measuring what I can with a the vernier, there is barely any deviation between where the belts run to where they do not. Having now removed the belt spacer and looking down the length of the teeth, I can't see any bending of the teeth. I would expect to see a wave looking down this way if the teeth were bent. I cannot see that. It has occurred to me that the apparent bent teeth could even be a machining error. I made the cutter that cut the teeth. I ground the tool by hand with the use of a profile projector to check for accuracy. A slightly asymmetric profile could be what I'm looking at. Teeth that are not bent would be very good news. I decided to test the part that drives the pulley and see what torque it can take. I've got it set up in the vise and I'm applying the maximum the torque wrench can do which is 160 pounds feet. See how much it's twisting with that torque, but it's not twisting beyond its yield strength. I calculated this part could take 295 pounds feet before permanent deformation. This is applying maximum engine torque of 55 pounds feet to the component. What I've come to realise over the duration of this project is that there are a number of challenges that make building a helicopter particularly difficult. Challenge 1 was to design and build a machine that could get off the ground. Challenge 2 was to make it controllable while teaching yourself to fly. Challenge 3 is to make what you have built reliable. I got halfway through Challenge 2 before I ended with the unscheduled rapid disassembly but I'm thinking how good would it be to achieve designing and building a homemade helicopter that was reliable to operate. I think that goal amongst the others would be just fantastic. What an exciting toy it would be then. Few homemade helicopters get as far as hovering, even fewer are operational for any length of time. Flying boat, wing and ground effect, ecranoplan, floaty planey build update now, and I've been making the control system. I made some pillow block style brackets and inserted an aluminium tube and made some plastic bearings. I made a bracket to direct the cables to the centre and I've made the pulleys to accommodate double cables. The idea here is to be able to move one control surface without affecting the other and to do it all through one control assembly. I calculated how much tension would be put on the cable during the hardest control stick pull I could realistically make and sized the cable to suit that tension, then added another redundant cable. I chose pull cables but there are other ways of controlling flight surfaces. Push pull tubes, push pull cables or a combination of all three. Not sure I've gone in the right direction here because I could have issues like frame flexing reducing the cable tension. Cables coming off a pulley has to be avoided and the number of pulleys required may make the control stiff to operate. Plenty to think about and thoughts are always welcome. I do find comments helpful in trying to make good decisions. Thank you.